I don't know. I don't know. Shoot. Okay, I'm gonna have to ask you not to pick at it. It'll never heal. <laughs> I just wanted to point upwards so I don't have to sit here like this the whole time. It's drooping. That will happen from time to time as you get older. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich. You're a loony. And Rish Outfield. I am not a loony! Howdy, y'all. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Episode 94. I'm Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Thanks for having us back in your lovely living room. Slash den. Yeah. Today we've got a uh, special treat for you. Thank you. Why, why, what is... Oh, for them. You, I, you were looking at me when you said special treat. Can, can I ask for a do-over? Have we started, have we started again? <laughs> <laughs> we've got a fun story for you. The story is Catastrophe Baker and a Canticle for Leibowitz by Mike Resnick. Wait, the Mike Resnick? The one and only. There's no other... I did a search, and it came up with zero results. Interesting. You wouldn't have thought, but the Mike Resnick. Very nice. Yeah. All right. So, uh, yeah, without, I mean, we, we've had too much further ado probably already, but it seems like we do a lot of further ado before stories when we used to always pledge to get right to it. So I think we'll get right to it today. Well, I don't think there's been much ado. I, we have a room for a tiny bit more ado, or a tiny bit more do. Ooh. Well, hey, let's put the ado after the story. All right. So just uh, roll it, okay, ROA to T. Okay, we bid you adieu. Ah, you see what you did there? <laughs> yeah, pun, the lowest form of humor. <laughs> Indeed it is. <laughs> About the author. Hi, I'm Mike Resnick. According to Locus, I am the all-time leading award winner, living or dead, for short science fiction. I've won five Hugos, a Nebula, and major awards in the USA, Spain, France, Poland, Croatia, and Japan. And I've been shortlisted for major awards in Italy, Australia, and England. I am the author of 62 novels, about 250 short stories, a couple of screenplays, and the editor of more than 40 anthologies. Over the years, I have been the science fiction editor for Ben Bella, a book company, and I have been the executive editor for the late lamented Jim Bain's universe. And I just found out three days before recording this that I am the guest of honor at the 2012 Worldcon, known as ChiCon 7, held in Chicago. Catastrophe Baker and a Canical for Leibowitz by Mike Resnick. I was standing at the bar in the outpost, which is the only good watering hole in the Plantagenet system, lifting a few with my old friend Hurricane Smith, another practitioner of the hero trade. Somehow or other, the conversation got around to women, like it always does sooner or later usually sooner, and he asked me what was the most memorable name I'd ever found attached to a woman. Now, man and boy, I've met 13 authentic pirate queens, and 11 of them were called Zenobia. So that figures to be a mighty memorable name, and the Siren of Silverstrike was pretty original, at least in my experience. But when it came down to choosing just the single most memorable name... I allowed that there was one that won hands down, and that was Voluptua Von Climax. You're kidding, said Smith. I wish I was, I told him, because a deeply tragic story goes with that name. You want to tell me about it? He said. I shook my head. It brings back too many painful memories of what might have been between her and me. Aw, oh, come on, catastrophe, he said. Some other time. I'm buying for as long as you're telling it to me, Smith offered. And this is the story I told him that night. 
out at the most distant edge of the inner frontier. It all began when I touched down on the pleasure planet of Calliope, which abounded in circuses and thrill shows and opera and ballet and theater and no end of fascinating rides like the no-gravity Ferris wheel. And, of course, there were hundreds of casinos and nightclubs. I moseyed around for a few hours, taking in all the sights, and then I saw her. And I knew I'd fallen hopelessly and eternally in love again. Trust me when I tell you that there ain't never been a woman like her. Her face was exotic and beautiful. She had long black hair down almost to her waist, beautifully rounded hips, a tiny waist, and I'll swear she had an extra pair or two of lungs. She was accompanied by a little guy who seemed to be annoying her because she kept walking away, which kind of reminded me of Jelly on Springs. And he kept following her, talking to Blue Streak. I knew I had to meet her, so I walked over and introduced myself. Howdy, ma'am, I said. My name is Catastrophe Baker, and you are the most beautiful thing I've seen during my long travels throughout the galaxy. Is this little twerp bothering you? Go away and leave us alone, snapped the little twerp. Well, that ain't no way to speak to a well-meaning stranger. So I knocked out eight of his teeth and busted three of his ribs and dislocated his left shoulder and kicked him in the groin as a mild reproof. And then turned my attention back to the beautiful, if beleaguered, lady. He won't bother us no more, ma'am, I assured her. And it seemed likely, since he was just laying there on the ground all curled up in a kind of a ball and moaning softly. How else can I be of service to you? Catastrophe Baker... She repeated in the most beautiful voice. I've heard about you. She kind of looked up and down all six feet nine inches of me. You're even bigger than they say. Handsomer, too, I said, in case she needed a hand. You know, she said thoughtfully, you might be just what the doctor ordered. If I was the doctor, I'd be more concerned with helping your friend here. I said, giving him a friendly nudge with my toe to show there wasn't no hard feelings. I really and truly didn't mean to break his nose with it. You misunderstand me. I heard you were kind of a law officer. (laughs) No, ma'am, I told her. You've been the victim of false doctrine. I ain't never worn a badge in my life. But didn't you bring in the notorious McNulty brothers? No neck and no nose? I confirmed. Yeah, I brought him in, ma'am, but only after they tried to cheat me at whist. Whist? She repeated. I find it difficult to picture you playing whist. We played a mighty fast and aggressive game of it out on the frontier, ma'am, I answered. Which was true. At one point, in the second hand, No-Nos played a dagger, and I topped him with a laser pistol, and then No-Neck tried to trump me with a blaster. But I finessed him by bringing the barrel of my pistol down on his hand and snapping all his fingers. Well, if you're not a lawman, what are you? A full-time freelance hero at your service, ma'am, I said. You got any heroin needs doing, I'm your man. She stared at me through half-lowered eyelids. I think you might be the very man I've been looking for, Catastrophe Baker. Well, I know you're what I've been looking for all my life, I told her. Or, at least since my back molars came in. You got a name, ma'am? Voluptua. She replied. Voluptua von Climax. Well, Miss Voluptua, ma'am, how's about you and me stepping out for some high-class grub? Or would you rather just rent a bridal suite first? Oh, that can wait, she said. I think I have a job for you. Is anyone else bothering you? I asked. Laying out men who prey on women, especially women with figures like yours, is one of the very best things I do. No, it's much more serious than that. Come with me, Catastrophe Baker, and I'll introduce you to the man I work for. 
and whom I hope you will soon be working for as well. So I fell into step alongside her, and soon we were in the theater district, which is this three-block area with a whole bunch of theaters, and then we saw a sign directing us to Saul Leibowitz's Messiah, which was the first indication I had that there was more than one of them. Anyway, we entered the theater, and she led me backstage to a plush office, and she opened the door without knocking, and we walked in and found ourselves facing a very upset man with thin and gray hair and the biggest smokeless cigar you ever saw. She walked right up to him and gave him a peck on the cheek, but he was too upset to notice. Finally, she spoke up and said, Solly, this is Catastrophe Baker, the famous hero, here to help us in our time of need. That woke him up, and he stared at me for a minute. You're really Catastrophe Baker? Yeah, I said. The same one who got kicked off Nimbus 4 for... They told me they were in their 20s, I said in my own defense. All 11 of them? I suppose they must have added their ages together. What did the judge say? The judge complained, I said. The press complained. The constabulary complained. But no one ever heard the girls complain. I turned to Voluptua. I hope you'll file that fact away for future reference, ma'am. That's neither here nor there, said the guy. My name is Saul Leibowitz, and I am in desperate need of a hero. Then this is your lucky day, I said, because you just found one. Just set me the challenge, name the price, and let's get this show on the road. Price? But I thought you were a hero. Heroes gotta eat too, you know. And when you're as big as me, that comes to serious money. All right. You name any reasonable price, and I'll pay it. Let me hear the job, and I'll decide what's reasonable, I answered. I'm producing a new musical. I know, I said. I saw the sign for something called The Messiah on my way in. Actually, he sniffed. The proper title is Saul Leibowitz's Messiah. And what's the problem? I'll be honest with you. The play was in serious danger of folding. Then I hired the famous show doctor Boris Gajinsky to fix it. Yesterday he added the most beautiful canicle in the second scene. The cast and director were sure everyone would love it, and we were set for our official opening next week. And then, last night, our only copy of the canticle was stolen. I need it back, Mr. Baker. Without it, I'm probably destitute by next week. I don't want to cause you no consternation, but I ain't never seen a canicle before. It doesn't matter. I know what it looks like, and I'm coming along. Are, are you sure? It could be dangerous. That's no problem, I said. I'll be there to protect her from danger. Who'll be there to protect her from you? He said. I'll be fine. Voluptua assured him. He turned to face me. She's 26. Just remember that you like them young. <laughs> what I mostly like them is female. But I didn't see no sense in arguing the point, so I did some quick mental math and told him I'd do the job for 10% of the first month's gross. 5%. Split the difference, I said. 9%. And I'm off to find the bad guys. He seemed about to argue, then just kind of collapsed back on his chair and sighed deeply. <sighs> Deal, he said. Okay, I said to Voluptua. Let's get going. I accompanied her to my ship, then came to a stop. I don't want to put a damper on your enthusiasm, I said, but I ain't got the slightest idea where to go next. That's all right. I have a pretty good idea who took it. Why didn't you tell Mr. Leibowitz? All he'd do is go out and hire a hero. And he already has. So where are we heading, I said, as I ordered the hatch to open and the ramp to descend. Stratford-on-Avon, too, she said as we entered the ship. I relayed our destination to the navigational computer, and a minute later, we shot up through the stratosphere. Then, she turned to me. Change course, she said. I beg your pardon, ma'am? Ain't we going to Stratford-on-Avon? That's what we want them to think, she said with a triumphant smile. And that's why I said it, in case we were being overheard. But I'm more than just a pretty face. She took a deep breath. And I was happy to agree that she was more than just a pretty face. Take us to Back Alley 4. I passed the order on to the computer. 
We will traverse the McDonald wormhole and will reach our destination in seven hours and three minutes. Announced Computer in its gentle feminine voice. Well, Catastrophe Baker, it looks like we've got some time to kill. Mm. She said, starting to slip out of her clothes. Have you got any ideas on how to make it pass more quickly? I allowed that she was giving me more ideas than I could handle. And then she was in my arms, and I gotta say that she felt even better than she looked. A minute later, I carried her to my bunk, and we spent a vigorous few hours killing time. And I can testify that she was mighty well named. And I feel sorry for those who think a climax just has something to do with the end of a video. For the longest time, I thought the ship had developed a new vibration. And then I finally figured out that what was vibrating was her. She was a mighty good kisser, too. And every now and then she'd get carried away and give me a bunch of little love bites. And a couple of them even drew blood. Which probably wasn't that surprising, considering how white her teeth looked when she smiled. Approaching back alley four. Announced the computer in what seemed like no time at all. A minute later it said, I'm not kidding. We're entering the atmosphere. Another minute, and then it said, Will you get your hand out of there and put your pants on before we land? I've never been so humiliated in my life. All right, all right, I muttered. Swinging my feet over to the deck. Keep your shirt on. Tell that hussy to keep hers on, said the computer. We finished getting dressed just as the ship touched down, then opened the hatch and walked out onto the planet's surface. As far as I could tell, back alley wasn't much of a world. No trees, no flowers, no animals, nothing much but a trader town that had sprung up maybe half a century ago, judging from the shape of the buildings. It was night out, and four little bitty moons were racing across the sky, casting their light down on the bleak surface of the planet. I don't mean to be overly critical, ma'am, I said, but what makes you think the canicles here? It's a mighty big galaxy, and there can't be 500 people tops in this little town. And as far as I can tell, there ain't no other towns on the planet. You're right, she said. There's just this one town. So what makes you think it's here? Because I know who stole it. Then why didn't you say so back in Leibowitz's office, I asked her. She shrugged, which is a mighty eye-catching thing to do when you're built like Voluptu von Climax. He'd want to know how I knew, and it would just lead to an awkward scene. Now that we're here, and he's a few light years away, I said, how did you know? Because he stole it for me, she said. He's madly in love with me, and he thought if he stole it, Solly would go broke, and then he'd have a clear path to my uh, affections. Now, personally, I hadn't noticed her putting up any blockades to her affections, but even so, it made sense that he'd want to get rid of the competition, at least the part he knew about, and it had the added advantage that sometime in the future he and Voluptua could resurrect the show with the missing canicle whatever that was, and make a fortune. What can you tell me about him, I asked. He's mean through and through, she told me. I think you should sneak up behind him and subdue him before he knows you're there. That's against the hero and code of ethics and sportsmanship, ma'am, I said. But they say he's the dirtiest fighter on the whole inner frontier. Good, I said. I hate it when a fight ends too soon. She stared at me. How long do your fights usually last? Oh, maybe six or seven seconds. She blinked very rapidly. Really? Heroes don't never lie, ma'am. I find that very exciting, she said, throwing her arms around me and nibbling a little on my lower lip. I kissed her back, then disengaged myself. We got time for this later, I said. But right now, I think I should be confronting this villain and getting back what was stolen. Where's he likely to be? Probably in one of the bars, carousing with drunken friends and cheap women. He got a name, ma'am? She wrinkled her nose and frowned. Cutthroat Hawk. He any relation to Cutthroat McGraw? I asked. 
She just stared at me. I guess not. Well, let's go find him and retrieve Mr. Leibowitz's goods. She led the way past two well-lit taverns to a little hole in the wall with bad lighting and a worse smell. I stood in the doorway and looked around. There were a bunch of aliens, most of them kind of animal, at least one vegetable, and a couple, I'll swear, wasn't even mineral. And none of them looked all that happy to see me. Then I spotted the one human sitting alone in the farthest corner, and I knew he had to be Cutthroat Hawk. He was wearing a leather tunic and metallic pants and well-worn boots, and it was clear that shaving wasn't his favorite sport. He was nursing a glass of something blue with a bunch of smoke coming out of it, and he didn't pay me any attention at all when I took a step or two into the room. Cutthroat Hawk, I bellowed. Your destiny has found you out. Are you going to turn over what you stole and come along peaceably? Or am I going to enjoy the hell out of the next half minute? Who the hell are you? I'm Catastrophe Baker, freelance hero by trade, and I'm here to right the terrible wrong you done to Saul Leibowitz and Voluptua Von Climax. Voluptua? He repeated, looking around. Is she here? Never you mind, I said. You got your hands full with me. She put you up to this, didn't she? I won't have you defaming the woman I momentarily love. Now, are you coming peaceably, or are you coming otherwise? There ain't no third choice. And no sooner had the words left my lips, which were still a little sore from all those love bites, than half a dozen aliens got up and blocked my way. Leave him alone, said one of them ominously. I can't do that, I said. He's a thief and a villain. He robbed a human. We approve. I don't want no trouble, I said. But you're standing between me and the object of my noble quest. He reached for a weapon and suddenly he wasn't standing between us no more. And I'm sure he'll walk again someday, once he gets out of whatever hospital they took him to after I got a little hot under the collar and flang him into a wall 40 feet away. Then a snake-like alien started coiling himself around me and squeezing for all he was worth. So I grabbed him by his neck, which was about 20 feet long, but I latched onto the part right behind his head. And I did a little squeezing of my own. And I don't doubt for a second that they can fix all them vertebrae I shook loose if he ever stops twitching long enough for them to go work on him. The other aliens suddenly decided they had urgent business elsewhere. And suddenly I found myself face to face with Cutthroat Hawk. Well, let me be more precise. Suddenly I found myself looking down the barrel of Cutthroat Hawk's blaster. I was too far away to grab it out of his hand, so I decided to try an heroic ruse. Hey, Cutthroat, I said. Your shoelace is untied. I wear boots. And your fly is unzipped. I use magnetic closures. And there's something with about 15 legs crawling up your sleeve. Boy, he said, if you're the best and brightest, the hero business has fallen on hard times. He'd have said something more, but just then the 15-legged spider bit him on the shoulder right through his sleeve, and he turned to slap it away, and whilst he was doing so, I kicked the blaster out of his hand and picked him up by the neck and held him a few feet above the ground. Now, ain't you sorry you put me to all this trouble? I said. He tried to answer, but he was turning blue from lack of air, and finally he just nodded his head. And if I put you down, you ain't gonna try and escape or go for a weapon, right? I said. And I'm sure he'd have said, right, if he'd still been awake. But he'd passed out from lack of air while I was asking the question. So I just released my grip and he fell on the floor in a heap. I examined his pockets, but there wasn't anything there except a few credits. Just enough to pay for his drinks. So I walked to the middle of the bar... Stuck a couple of fingers in my mouth and whistled to get all the aliens' attention. I need to know where Cutthroat Hawk stored his worldly possessions, I announced. They all just stared at me, sullen and silent. I'd really appreciate your help, I said. 
No answer. Okay, I said, busting a chair apart and holding a leg up. I guess one of you is going to have to volunteer to help me look for it. Suddenly, every alien in the joint was telling me that he kept his goods in a box under his bed in room 17 of the boarding house next door. I walked out, met Voluptua, told her to keep an eye on Cutthroat Hawk, not that he was going anywhere, and then I went up to Hawk's room. Sure enough, there was a small box under the bed. In it was a diamond ring and a matching bracelet, wrapped up in some old wrinkled paper. I looked around for something that might be a canical and couldn't find it, and finally figured, well, at least Mr. Leibowitz could pawn the diamonds to keep the play running an extra week or two, so I stuffed the whole package in my pocket. I gathered Voluptua and Hawk up, carried him over his shoulder to my ship, bound his hands and feet with negatronic manacles for safekeeping, stuck him in a corner where we couldn't trip over him, and a minute later we'd reach light speeds, and were headed back to Calliope. Once again, Voluptua decided it was too warm for clothes, and she doffed hers and came over and started to help me out of mine. Finally, I felt a certain familiar sense of urgency and carried her over to the bed. But you're still wearing your pants. But unlike Hawks, mine got a zipper. And I demonstrated it to her, and then she demonstrated some things to me. And then it felt like the ship was vibrating again, and then she was covering me with painful, but loving, little bites. And finally she plumb wore me out and I fell asleep. I woke up when I felt a hand in my pocket that almost certainly wasn't mine. And sure enough, it belonged to Voluptua. What's going on, I said. I was just smoothing out your pants pocket, my love. From the inside, I asked. Before she could answer, I got the distinct impression that something was missing. I sat up and looked around. And it turns out that what was missing was Cutthroat Hawk. Well, let me amend that. Most of him was missing. What was left were his clothes and a few bones. I walked over to make sure, though in my experience, mighty few people walk off and leave their bones behind. What the hell happened here? I demanded. She gave me an innocent smile. I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm talking about losing an entire prisoner while we're cruising along at light speeds, I said. She gave me an unconcerned shrug. These things happen. Not on my ship, they don't, I said. She gave me a very unladylike burp. I looked from the bones to her, to the bones, and back to her again. You ate an entire prisoner, I said. I'd have saved some for you, my love, but they don't keep well. You ate him? What are you getting so upset about? I didn't use your galley, and I cleaned up after myself. If you were hungry, why didn't you just say so, I said. I'd have been happy to stop off at a restaurant. I was going to have to kill him anyway. He betrayed me. How? He was my partner. We stole the canticle together, but then he decided not to share the proceeds with me. She made a face. He was a terrible man. I'm glad I ate him. Do you do this a lot? Steal canticles? This was my first. I meant eat your partners, I said. My partners? Not very often. Well, I ain't no policeman, so I ain't turning you in. We'll let Mr. Leibowitz decide what to do with you. You don't have to tell him, she said, putting her arms around me. I love you, Catastrophe Baker. I know, and I got the love bites to prove it. You know you loved them. It was an interesting experience, I admitted. I ain't never been an appetizer before, she laughed. And while she did, I took a quick look to see if her teeth were filed. We talked about this and that and just about everything except our favorite foods. And finally, the ship touched down. And a couple of minutes later, the two of us walked into Leibowitz's office. That was fast said Leibowitz, obviously impressed. I didn't expect you back for two or three more days. Us heroes don't waste no time, I said. 
I'm pleased to announce that the culprit that robbed you is no longer among the living. You killed him? <laughs> no. Your lady friend put him out of his misery. He looks surprised. Really? Ask her yourself, I said. He turned to Voluptua. How did you do it? With a blaster? A knife? Poison? You got 17 more guesses. And my bet is that you're gonna need them all. He got up and walked around his desk until he was standing right in front of her and hugged her. As long as you're safe, that's all that matters. He kissed her. She kissed him. He flinched. And I could see he was missing a little bit of lip when they parted. Always enthusiastic. That's my voluptua, he said, turning to me. And did you bring me back my candle? I'm afraid not, I said, pulling the package out of my pocket. All he had were these diamonds. I started unwrapping them when he grabbed the paper out of my hand, unfolded it, and held it up to the light. My candle! He cried happily after he read it over. I always thought a canicle was some kind of a fruit, like a honeydew melon, I said. <laughs> he laughed as if I had made a joke, then summoned his staff to tell them that he'd got his canicle back. And since everyone was busy admiring the canicle and praising Voluptua for her bravery, I decided no one would notice or mind if I kept the diamonds for myself, since they didn't rightly belong to anyone, or at least anyone that wasn't thoroughly digested by now. And that's the way I left them. Blebowitz, Voluptua, and the Canicle. <laughs> Hurricane Smith downed his drink. So how much was your 9% of the play worth? Nothing, I said. The damn thing closed on opening night. The critics said it was the worst hymn anyone ever heard. <laughs> Hurricane chuckled. That's critics for you. They're never happy unless they're convincing you that what you like just isn't any good. He poured himself another one. Still, it was an interesting story. Are they still together, the producer and the lady? Far as I know, I answered. I guess it was pretty interesting at that. Maybe I'll write it up for one of them true adventure holodisks. Why not? He agreed. You got a title? I thought I'd call it a canicle for Leibowitz. He shook his head. Mm. You may get top marks as a space hero, but you ain't ever going to make it as a writer if you think something called a canticle for Leibowitz is going to sell more than ten copies. It does lack a little punch, I admitted. What would you call it? Well, that's easy enough. I'd call it a cannibal for Leibowitz. It made perfect sense to me. And if I ever ride this heroic epic up, that's exactly what I'm going to call it. Unless some effete namby-pamby editor changes it to something else. And now, a word about today's story. In 2001, I had out a novel from Tor titled The Outpost, which had a bunch of mildly humorous, hardly believable, bigger-than-life frontier characters, and the one that I enjoyed the most was Catastrophe Baker. So when I had the opportunity to put him in a story, a short story, I decided that his job for the rest of his life and mine, if we live long enough, was to take every trope of science fiction and turn it on its ear. The first of these stories was Catastrophe Baker and the Cold Equations. The current one that's being podcast now is Catastrophe Baker and a Canticle for Leibowitz. And over the coming years, as I say, if we're both still around, he'll be doing uh, The Three Laws of Robotics and, and all the other tropes. Anyway, it was a lot of fun to write. He's a lot of fun to, to share uh, my time with, and I hope you enjoy him. I did, I did the whole friggin' story. I know, but it's just <laughs> weird that I would do one, two, three, four parts. All right, everybody, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the story. Did you? I did. Give me a friggin' cast list, you... <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Instead of just saying this person, that person, and the other person lent their voice to the show, we thought we'd give an actual list of credits for who did what. So this week... Our narrator, Mr. Catastrophe Baker, was voiced by Big Anklevich. Saul Leibowitz, Hurricane Smith, Cutthroat Hawk, and Various Aliens, 
were voiced by Rish Outfield. That's just greedy. <laughs> Voluptua von Climax was voiced by the dulcet tones of Ms. Julie Hoverson. And the ship's computer was voiced by R.E. Chambliss. So music and sound effects would be in the show notes? That's right. We uh, did get some music from here and there and some sound effects from there and here. And you can see them all clicking on the, uh, the links in the show notes. Now, should we ask people if they prefer us to do cast of characters at the end of each story or just the way we used to do it? Or should we just say, hey, this is how it is from now on. Like it or lump it. Well, we can ask them what they think. That doesn't mean that we're going to care. <laughs> I've only got three listeners we're down to. Yeah, something like that. Fudge them. <laughs> you know, fudge them right up there. Uh, hey, hey, uh, okay. Enough with the offensive comments, sir. What, was that offensive? Why, listen to Everything you say is offensive. I don't know how you do it. Well, it's a talent, I guess. Yeah. So, hey, Mike Resnick, again. That's right. How did that come about? How, what, how the hell did we get him for Princess of Earth? Begging and pleading on bended knee. When was that? It was last year sometime. It was last year, yeah, in February, I believe. It was one of our uh, Valentine's Day stories that we did <sighs> leading up to Valentine's. Shoot, we should talk about Valent. No, never mind. <laughs> that was well received, I thought. I thought so too. It's hard for a Mike Resnick story to not be well received, though. I mean, it's always good. So, yeah, that's, that's a good point. There's that. Still, it was uh, it was significant for us. I, I think more people listen to that episode than listen to most. And, True. And uh, we got something of a Parsec nomination for that little story. You guys were nominated for a Parsec? <laughs> there must have been some sort of a misprint. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, thanks, announcer man. Uh, you, belt. Contributed. Uh, you contributed to that, too, I, I, I'm sure. And so he sent us an email after the nominations came out, I think. Yeah. And he said, congratulations on the Parsec nomination. You know, I'm, I'm sick to death of awards myself, but you two may be <laughs> new to the whole award season game for your consideration kind of thing. And, you know, I emailed him back and I, you know, I was blown away. I still kind of am <laughs> that we got that nomination. And I told him, you know, I don't think anybody would have noticed us had it not been for who wrote that story. Right. And let us know if there are any more that we can F up for you. I mean, <laughs> record for you. And uh, he got right back to me. Can you call up that email? Tell me what he, he said. He says, do you want serious or funny? I know I have this reputation of making people cry when they hear my stories being podcast, but my bibliographer recently told me that I have sold 126 funny science fiction stories, more even than Sheckley. It's just that podcasters never ask for them. And of course, we responded back saying, in that case, funny for sure. So uh, yeah, he gave us several to choose from. This is what we picked and it was a fun story. Oh, geez, it was so much fun. I hope that he had fun listening to our interpretation of it because Catastrophe Baker, like he said in the, in the uh, what, what would you even call that? The you author's call note. That? You know, he is a larger than life character. And so I felt like we could go all out with the voices and stuff like that. And uh, uh -huh. yeah, it, because the story is so broad, we got to be really broad. Uh -huh. There's a certain tone for a certain kind of story. And the voices that we did in this wouldn't have worked for Princess of Earth. <laughs> Definitely not, yeah. But it, sometimes Norm will have a story on his Drabblecast where you can just come up with funny voices and it's fun to do. And it's just because of the way the story is written, you've got stuff like this. And then other times, all the characters have to be subdued and, and reined in. And, and this one, I, I think you proclaimed that you were going to do it in some kind of drawl. Uh -huh. And I said, oh, no, you better not. Don't you do that. And you said, if you can talk in that funny voice you're doing, <laughs> I'm going to do it in a drawl. And ultimately, I think that was the way to go. I think your instincts were right on that. Didn't you have fun with? I did. I love doing that drawl for some reason. I think the only other time that I've actually was when we did Cast the Demon Shadow. I pulled out that, that same Western accent for that one. And... Uh... A pretty serious. I mean, it wasn't a, a, a wacky story like this one was. It wasn't some kind of a crazy tall tale, much different than this one. But I think it really worked. I was much more over the top, I think, for this one, too, because, you know. It welcomed it, yeah. Yeah, you get to say lines like, I don't like you defaming the woman I presently is. <laughs> what does he say? <laughs> Something about, uh, I can't remember what he says. Oh, well, screw it. Cast a demon shadow. 
I think it's significant because it was the first Western that we did, but it's also the first story that Julie Hoverson did a voice right. for us with. Right. And Julie voiced Voluptua Von Climax. <laughs> and at present, I have no idea what her reading of the character sounds like. Who did the voice when we read it? Me or you? Probably You did. Me. Yeah, you did it. And sometimes it's so fun to just read all the characters in these stories and uh, when you actually have a, another, an actress come in or whatever, it's, it's a shame to lose our <laughs> silly voices and all that. But uh, did you have to finesse Julie at all to get her to do a character like this? Oh, not at all. Yeah. Um, it's funny because I sent it off to Julie. I, as soon as, uh, you know, I saw the name of the character, you knew you get a kind of a feel as to how the voice has to sound just by the name. But, you know, you also see the lines and stuff like that. And I just thought... This character has to have just an, an obscenely sexy voice. And oh, exactly right away, oh, this is Julie. Julie is perfect for this. She's done some characters like this for us in the past. But she, yeah, she's got such a great range of all sorts of different things. But somebody's got a sexy voice. It's Julie, you know. She's just amazing at that. And it's funny because she, I think, enjoyed the story just as much. You know, when, when she sent her uh, lines back to me, um, underneath she says pardon the hysterical giggling from time to time so I think she probably had as much fun with this uh, story as we did the one thing that I really like about this story is it, it doesn't care it's just happy to be as politically incorrect as it wants to be it just goes for it and uh, you know I really love that about it you know sometimes that just gets in the way of everything when you worry about that kind of stuff and well, uh, well as you know i i seldom worry <laughs> that's true you know let the uh, the the cocks and the oh, okay. oh sorry <laughs> well that, hey that's good and and hopefully mike likes it i guess he's the ultimate judge i i hope that the audience cares and thinks that it's fun laughs along and says oh bring on catastrophe baker too or Catastrophe Baker 1 in this case. Yeah. I, I guess that's kind of up to Mike, right? I hope he says, oh, thumbs up, boys. Go on ahead and come over to my house and have cookies some. <laughs> yeah, who knows? I'll let you look at all my awards. <laughs> so you can imagine what you will never actually experience. It's an honor just to be nominated. It is. It, I guess we've talked about that. And Mike Willing will be uh, nominated again this year. <laughs> there you go. Now, um... Uh, if you don't mind making fun of me for a few minutes. Okay, I'm good at that. I didn't get the reference, A Canticle for Leibowitz, ah, when I read right. this story. And it wasn't until I was talking to a friend of mine about the story that he said, no, 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 A Canticle for Leibowitz is a book. It's an old a book from the 60s. How have you never heard of that? Have you ever read a book? <laughs> What's wrong with it? Your zipper is half down. <laughs> and and you know what? I'm not sure that your eyes are exactly – you got a Shannon Doherty thing going. And by this point, I was really hurt. Yeah? So I talked to you. But the Shannon I, Doherty thing made you feel better? She always does. <laughs> the, so the next time I got together with you, I said, Big, were you aware that there's already a story called A Canticle for Leibowitz? I think this Resnick guy is ripping him off. I, I, <laughs> and you said, just, just stop talking. <laughs> you gave me the look you're giving me now. Right. Is this the part where I'm supposed to make fun of you now, or, or is that already over? I think I took care of it, but <laughs> go right ahead. Fire away, as they yeah. say. Yeah, a Canticle for Leibowitz. That's a, a classic sci-fi story. We talk a lot about post-apocalyptic stories on the show, and that's one of those. From way back in the 60s, written by Walter M. Miller. It was an interesting story, basically, and you may well be the only person that's hearing this that's not familiar with the book itself, but it's a post-apocalypse. So apocalypse has happened, and basically civilization is being kept alive by these Catholic monks, and they have this kind of skewed idea of the way things were, and this Leibowitz, who is the founder of their order or whatever was like a architect or something like that where and they have you know they they look at these blueprints that he left behind as sort of sacred relics and they make illuminated versions of the original thing that 
Leibowitz left behind with them, and you know they're they're trying to save civilization for when it finally is able to be reborn. It goes all the way through that, and it's really interesting just putting it in that kind of a, a context. Who would save civilization if this apocalypse did happen? Where would it all be? Would the Library of Congress still be around, you know, for all the things that were written to be saved? Or would that just fry up in the nuclear bombs with everything else? It's, of course, that has little to do with the story, really, because like, the canticle for Leibowitz that we get in this story here is just a, a parody version of that. You know, it's a, a song that they're looking for. I, I, I prefer the cannibal for Leibowitz title myself. <laughs> Yeah, it is fun. And I, but and some I, namby-pamby effete editor changed it on him. <laughs> it's good that we can laugh about such things. Yes. Uh, he mentioned in that author's note, forthcoming works. And even I recognize the three laws of robotics. Oh, wow. Really? Because they made a terrible, terrible, oh, three right. times a lady movie about it. Oh, that's uh, right. Uh, Bicentennial but, Man, yeah. That was a good movie. Uh, well, I remember... Was it Cory Doctorow who did this series of short stories where he'd name a short story after a famous science yeah. fiction novel? Right. Uh, just to see if he could, or as a gag, or as a, or a writing experiment, or as a dare. I'm not really sure what the deal was. <laughs> yeah, he has a story called I, Robot, and he also has a story called I, Robot. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. Well, he had an Ender's Game one, too. Yep. It was called Anda's Game. Anda's Game, yeah, that's right. And I, I, there was there were more. Too. There were several others because yes. I'm not well read. Because I'm not read at all, I didn't recognize some of the names that other people would. And I would imagine that if you're familiar with the text that this is riffing on, it's even more amusing to you. Maybe not. I don't know. For once, I'm not in on the joke, so I don't know. I think that's kind of a fun thing to do to be able to tip your hat to older stuff and, you know, be able to throw things like that in. Yeah, I remember one time, uh, what was the story? I want to say it was Jason Sanford's Maps of the Bible where uh, we had Josh Roseman do lines for it. He was he was doing the character of the preacher man that comes into town to get with the main character's mother. The only and, man uh, who could ever move me. Or wait, what was it? It was the son, of, son a preacher, of a preacher man. man. And just for fun, as he was doing pretend lines of where he was saying goodbye to everybody after church, for for the heck of it, he just named every person in this church after some science fiction author. This person was this, and this person was this. <laughs> it's just to let you know. <laughs> it's always fun to be able to do that kind of stuff. It's like when we did our Christmas episode, and all the characters were named after. I don't remember. <laughs> I wrote it, but I don't, I'm, and I'm sure I did it on purpose. Who? Yes, you did. They were all named after people from uh, It's a Wonderful Life. Twin Peaks. What's the name of that oh, show? Oh, that's right. They were all named after Twin Peaks people. And somebody picked up on that. Is Twin Peaks the name of the show? Mm -hmm. Really? Who was it that picked up on it? I think it was Julie who found that to be a humorous. And I guess that's sort of a, a fine line you walk. Because I've written very serious, very sober stories. And as soon as somebody realized, hey, you know, his mom and dad were George and Lorraine and his name's Martin. That's not funny, man. You, you, you've taken me out of the story. And I was like, oh, I, sorry. Yeah, that is possible, I suppose. I remember you did a story where all the characters were named after Star Trek actors. And that never took me out of the story. Of course, a lot of it might have to do with the fact that I don't know Star Trek like you do. So... When I hear those names, it doesn't automatically jump out at me. Hey, look at me. I'm Star Trek. But yeah, that, that can be a, a danger, I suppose. Well, it's just a way of entertaining myself. Right. I don't know if you find writing to be tedious sometimes. But coming up with names for characters is often just a headache or an irritation. You know, I, right. sometimes it's, I would prefer to just say I or boy or he <laughs> Or whatever than having to come up with things and I don't know maybe that's a flaw that I have in writing but uh, I know people that just agonize over character names you know so, uh -huh. oh it's got to just sound right you, you got to hear that name and think of this character that I've come up with and I'm not sure that that's even possible yeah I mean there are, there are some names that give you a kind of a idea 
Voluptua von Climax. Right. Voluptua von Climax is going to be a certain kind of a person. <laughs> or if your character is named like Rock Atlas. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that, you know. He can't be. Uh... Although, strangely, Rock Hudson was gay. You are. But still, he didn't come across as that, you know. You <laughs> you hear that name and it just sounds like a tough guy. But sometimes you get that. But for the most part, yeah. If you, we, we were interviewed by the Full Cast podcast the other day. And we talked with the hosts of that show, who are Brian Lincoln and Abby Hilton. I'm sure you've heard those names on here before. And you can swing over to fullcastpodcast.com and check out that interview if you'd like. But yeah, we were talking with Brian about character names. And uh, he mentioned that if a character name was too plain or too humdrum, not something interesting, then he was turned off to the story. I guess there's then some worth in agonizing over a name and coming up with Rock Atlas or whatever it is. That, uh, well, well if, if I hear the name Tommy Thompson or... What was Johnny it? Johnson? Johnny Johnson. It takes me out of the story as yeah. well because those are such crappy names. <laughs> names that I always really enjoyed was from the uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory movie with Gene Wilder where the parents of all the various people that got the golden tickets were always Henry and Henrietta. <laughs> the uh, oh. female version of the male name each time was, was the wife and the husband. So, you know, I, I always thought that was pretty funny. But, you know, that was supposed to be a funny movie, so doing something like that just makes it all the more chuckle-worthy. Except for the scary tunnel. Yeah, scary tunnel. Not a candy-making tunnel. Just a scary tunnel. Like show bugs crawling on people's faces and chickens getting their head cut off, you know? They're not making candy, though. They're just getting their chickens' heads cut off. Oh, you mentioned Brian Lincoln. He seems to be producing stories for us right now. That's right. A lot of people are producing uh-huh. stories for us. Hence, we've got a friggin' episode today instead of <laughs> in late March when it was originally scheduled. Uh, who produced this episode today? This episode today was produced by Big Anklevich. Oh, f*** him. Never mind. <laughs> um, I'm sorry I brought it up. Well, okay, we- come on, man. The hate letter of the week's going to be coming back if you don't cut that crap. I'm sorry. No, no, no. We, we've had a lot of people volunteer to produce episodes for us, you know, to edit things mm-hmm. for us, to, to get their friends to do voices. To join in the fun. Join us. And it's been such a load off, at least for you. For me, it's exactly the same amount of work. <laughs> it's been such a load off, though, for us who are used to handling all of the production ourselves. Uh, you were bringing up the schedule before we started recording. And it's like, we've got like six episodes. We know when they're going to air, barring some catastrophe, Baker. We actually have episodes in the can coming. And right. It's like, wow, that's just amazing. It's a relief and it's going to help if people actually like the show. It's going to help them get more episodes at a more timely basis. Right. So I think that's cool. Did I have a point? I don't know. Were you going back to... Well, talk. Say something. Express some kind of appreciation for these people that have helped us. Okay. At one point, you said something today, or or on the interview with Brian about you know every single moment of free time used to go to the podcast, and now your kids actually know that you exist. And- <laughs> yeah, it really it was that way for a while. I think at one point we maybe for a whole month where we made it to a point where we were a weekly show, and uh, yeah, during that time, that's what I was doing every time I had moments to spare i would go in and i would start editing on something and i would work on it all the time every free second that i had and i didn't do any writing and i didn't spend any time with my family i think unfortunately that they did resent that a little the fact that i paid them no mind because this podcast took all my time and so you know yeah i definitely want to thank all those folks who have volunteered to produce for us and if you are someone who would like to produce but haven't volunteered yet you know we we welcome your participation the more people that we have the better things will be it's great because yeah it saved my marriage saved my 
family, my, my children will remember that they had a father instead of remember that jerk that never paid any attention to them and never loved them. And so they had to go and get into heavy drugs and prostitution and uh, thievery and all those things that eventually wound them up in prison where I still never see them. Big Anklevich, so pathetic it'd be funny if it wasn't so sad. Thank you, announcer man. So, uh, you know, it's nice to uh, not have to deal with that. To be able to still have the show and not have to deal with that. Yeah, for a while there, your youngest daughter was referring to you as the sperm donor. I heard her say that. <laughs> it sort of horrified me. It sort of turned me on, too. <laughs> Warning, today's um, comments from Rish Outfield are especially stupid. Listener discretion <laughs> is advised. Yeah, okay. Uh, yes, thank you to the people who have done that. And, you know, if you'd like to volunteer to be a producer... Uh, just send us an email at editor at com, and you can direct the show, cast the parts, and tell us how you want us to do it. Or you can have us record the show and get other people to volunteer to do the parts, and you can just edit it together. You can go the whole shebang, get all your buddies to do it yourself and do the sound effects and do the music and edit it together and send it to us. Any amount of, of help is is great. Yeah. We'd love to have you. And speaking of that, dude, we've had so many people donate in the last couple of months. Now, I don't know if it has anything to do with our incentive episode. That was me making quotes in the air. Uh, but, you know, so many people have donated that uh, I, I think we've got an announcement to make. And can you make an announcement and make it good, sperm donor? Zoom chink. There's the, wait, that's not quite the right music for an announcement. Maybe we need the <laughs> Zoom chink. Um, yeah, uh, we've decided to double our pay rate for uh, folks who send in stories to us. It's been low for quite some time. It's still not going to be back to what we started out with. When we started out, I just thought, oh yeah, we need to pay at least this much. Of course, in those days, nobody knew we existed, so we got no donations, and uh, it all came out of my own pocket, and I think I'm still trying to dig myself back out of that hole, but we got a lot of donations, like Rich said, and, and we're definitely thankful for that, and we wanted to be able to pay our authors more, because seriously, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of work to put something together that's good enough to be a podcast on the show, and, and, and still, we're a long ways from making it truly worth uh, the author's while other than hey we we made a great uh, uh audio version of your story that you know there's that that we can pay them with but the, we'd also like to be able to pay them the money that the effort is worth and so we've doubled our pay um, and that's uh, effective immediately right yeah effective immediately it still isn't a lot but you know we've doubled it and uh, we look to hopefully be able to keep doing that um i think that we may do another incentive episode in the next few months because, you know, this one worked out fairly well, you know. So you can look forward probably to a story written by Big Anklevich this time around. Although I don't know if that's an incentive or a decentive. Is that, that's not a word, is it? Decentive? Oh, I like it. Let's start using decentive. That shows you the quality of the writing of Big Anklevich. You might find words like decentive in the story. <laughs> I'll just make things up when I need something to work for it. Well, irregardless of that, Dave, I think <laughs> that'll be fun. Today you were talking about your relief of not having to edit every single episode uh, or every story that gets sent in to uh -huh. us. And, and you said, someday, I'm just going to edit the incentive episodes. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's cool. But uh, yeah, maybe we'll go a little bit bigger than we did on the last one. The last one was just you and me and I, you put very minimal sound effects and music in there mm -hmm. but maybe th your story i mean I, you haven't chosen it yet but maybe it'll be one with a bigger cast and stuff like that we'll we'll see how it goes we'll we'll let people know when that's done and when that's ready to go but in the meantime thank you for donating thank you for listening uh, thank you for sending your stories in thank you for the wonderful valentine's day i had oh no i'm sorry what was i thinking thank you for producing thank you for doing voices this isn't our last episode. Why am I doing all the thanks? I don't know, because you're happy. <laughs> I have no idea what a happy Rish Outfield would sound like. 
And now it's time to talk about something completely different. Hey, Big, how are you with trivia? You know, I really like trivia. I've always been kind of, I think that might, it, maybe it's just a man thing or maybe it's not, but. I'm sorry, a giant sized man thing? <laughs> it might be giant sized if you're talking about Big Anklevich. Um, <laughs> Big Anklevich, you're my hero. I, yeah, you know, I think it's just one of those, like I try to get my wife to play like Trivia Pursuit and stuff like that. And Bondage, she's, things like that. Yeah, the, yeah any of the, you know. Trivial Pursuit, um, Cosplay, Doctor, Role Playing, you know, any of those kind of games. No, Trivial Pursuit, I, I've tried to get her to play it with me a bunch of times, and she's just not interested. Because I guess she just doesn't do well at it. But yeah, all my friends that are guys are totally like, oh yeah, let's do it. Let's play this and let's play, you know, Trivial Pursuit or Seen It or whatever those kind of trivia type games. They're all totally into. So I don't know if that's a... So it's a guy thing. I don't know if it's a men are from Mars, women are from Venus kind of thing or not, but I think it's great. I love it. Test your skills, knowledge kind of games kind of thing. I don't know what the deal is with it, but I really enjoy it myself. Why do you ask? Well, I'm also quite the fan of, of trivia, and uh, the 80s band Devo got their name <laughs> from this scientific term. Uh, the reason What I... is devolution, Alex? That's exactly what... Me and the other guy said. <laughs> this way, you laugh, but dude, those things are stressful as hell, man. You're standing in front of these people, pressing the buzzer. and uh, oh, I could just see it in my head. The guy going, what is devolution? No, I'm sorry. That's incorrect. Beep, beep, beep. What uh, is Mr. evolution? What is devolution? <laughs> yeah, they didn't even say it's incorrect. They just said, get out. <laughs> Exit the premises. Uh, so... <laughs> the reason I mention this is our good friend, Lizanne Hurd, or good uh -huh. friend of the show, Lizanne Hurd. Have we established the difference between a good friend and a friend of... Okay, a friend of the show will help you move. A good friend will help you move a body. So let's, <laughs> okay. let's, let's, let's keep that in mind. But our friend of the show, uh, Lizanne Hurd, is part of a an, an, an online trivia game show podcast oh cool and it's called guru showdown and basically it's just one contestant and then there's four gurus and each person is an expert in their particular field oh Liz they're not like actual gurus these are just people that are smart they are about tibetan something. monks <laughs> and a sensei this doesn't really a, sound uh, that uh, interesting you go and talk to some gurus they tell you about your your chakra. Oh, my right. turkey just jumped in there. And so each guru is a person you are competing against, and they have their little category that they are masters their of. Their strength. Basically, they ask you a question. They ask them a question. The first person to seven points wins. And, then they, and the, the reason I'm mentioning all this, Happy Crappy, is because I got to be a contestant on the oh, Guru wow. Showdown. You made it through the uh, trial process this time around? I believe the entire trial process was saying, yes, I will be a contestant. <laughs> Sounds like the trial process for you. It is. And, you know, it's funny. At the end of that Jeopardy audition, they said, you know, hey, six months from now, September or whatever it is, we will have auditions again because they do them twice a year. Uh -huh. uh, so any of you who failed miserably, except for you, sir, <laughs> come back in six months. And, yeah, I just I stumbled out off the Sony lot I'm never coming back after that. <laughs> and, you know, it's a shame in retrospect. And, and that's, that's what life is all about, in, or at least my life, is in retrospect, I'm like, well, why wouldn't I have come back? You Just because you got Devo wrong? Yeah, there was a question that I got wrong and I felt stupid about it. But, you know, the next time maybe I'd do all right. And, and Yeah, the next time when they ask you how Faster Pussycat got their name, you'd be all over it, right? Faster Pussycat Kill Kill? <laughs> I just, I never went back. I, I, I shouldn't have been humiliated because I made it through the first tier of qualification or, 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 or whatever you call that, uh, mm -hmm. elimination. Okay. And there were only th two. They did the, the, the paper test. Then they did the mock game. And the winner of the mock game went on to the real game. What's an actual contestant? So, you know, I, I, I would maybe have made it farther the next time. Yeah, I never know. But 
You would have never made it past Ken Jennings, but, you know, who would? No, that's, that's a good point. But maybe it would be an experience. It would be fun. You're, you yeah. know, your, your hometown is rooting Although, for you. Is it, is it like um, it was on The Simpsons when Marge went to uh, Jeopardy? And I'm she, sure I don't know. I'm sure the show was absolute crap by the time. She wound up uh, with negative, and negative dollars, and they said, no, no, you owe us $1,000. <laughs> they wouldn't let her leave. <laughs> that could have been bad for you. It could have. <laughs> so tell us about this guru show. Oh, yeah. yes. I'm sorry. So basically, I got to be a contestant. And there was a history geography guru. There was a video game guru. There was a animal guru, which uh, was Lizanne. And then there was a music guru, a mm-hmm. lovely girl named Kaylee that I battled against, who knew a lot about music. Yeah. And I... Does she know about fixing a starship, though? <laughs> she loves her captain. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry. I've got to be able to come up with a, a line better than than that that she says. She ain't had nothing betwixt her nethers, and <laughs> I could stand to hear a little more. So I did badly. Yeah. I thought uh, Liz afterward emailed me, and she's like, "Why well, you, you seemed uncomfortable? You seemed nervous." I was like, "Well." <sighs> It was a competition, and I was getting questions wrong. And then they'd ask a question to the other person, and I'd be like, oh, oh, I know that one. For example, they said, what was the name of the Apollo 11 module that actually touched down uh, on the moon? Uh Uh-huh. Or in Nevada desert, according to my uncle, (laughs) and I knew that one, you know. And they they asked a couple things like that, and I knew. That's the eagle, right? It it was obviously the eagle has landed. Right. They said, uh, you know, who sang "Sugar, Sugar"? Archies. The Archies, exactly. And I knew that, and the, cont- the <laughs> comp- competitor didn't. How did you know? Uh, have it. All right. So anyway, I'm, I'm talking way more than I need to. Uh, you can go to www.guruShowdown.com and listen to my episode. I think I'm like episode three. Or you can email the people, the producers of this show, and say, you know, F those guys. I can do a hell of a lot better. I want to be a contestant. And I guess they're just taking contestants. They, they, they're they even taking like team contestants, you know, yeah. Wonder Twin Powers Activate. It's too bad that didn't work out for us to do a tag team thing because then, you know, all the questions that you didn't know, maybe I would have known. That would have been cool. Well, let's see if I can come up with a question that I got wrong and see if you know the answer. Okay. De-evolution. You oh, sorry. bastard. You were going to come up with a new question. Can you we wrong? let that die, please? <laughs> Holy crap. Another one that I got wrong was uh, this 1982 hit by Joan Jett and the Black Hearts was also the theme to the short-lived TV show Freaks and Geeks. Oh, that was in the written exam on yeah. Jeopardy? I thought you were going to give me a guru showdown question. You... Well, no, I was, but you gave me the oh. evolution. What is that song? Hate uh, myself for loving you. No, it's got to be. I don't give a damn about my bad reputation. And I see how the f do you know? I actually saw an episode of Freaks and Geeks once. I'm just thinking and... what it ha- I mean, she's got like three or four songs. Okay. Got to be one of them. All right, all right. Oh, well, I'll tell you what. You're so much smarter than me, a hole. <laughs> that why don't you get on the friggin' show and beat my score? Maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll give it a shot. It just so happens that Liz has invited me to be a contestant on this show as well. So we shall okay, see well, how okay, it goes. Well, then I challenge you. What was your score? To beat my score. I don't. I don't. Because, yeah, we could go through how I did in each category and all that. But basically, until we got to music, I sucked. <laughs> and, and we don't need to tell everybody everything either. Because if we do, they won't have a reason to listen to the show. Right. But this is our show. And I am all that really matters. Oh, okay. But at the end of the, the game. I'd forgotten about that. You know, I was competing against music. <clears throat> and so they would just play a, a snippet. 10 second, a snippet or five seconds or something like that of a song. And you had to identify the the artist and the, the title. Uh-huh. And that was when I, I did fairly well. Although Kaylee, the girl that I was competing against, was really good. They, they played one note. And she's like, ah. And she named the, I think it was a Pink Floyd song or something like that. Hmm. Like, Holy crap. I might get my butt I'm, I'm kicked. dead man. meat. I don't know. It'll be interesting to hear it edited together. I mean, not that there's much editing that they had to do it was pretty much live right they'd say okay go you know and then they'd have a commercial and we just who knows maybe there's music or something like that when maybe but but ding, okay ding, 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 ding. right <laughs> i i don't think that's what they used but 
I either got 24 or 27. Okay. I don't know. Uh, but I challenge you to do better than that. Okay, well, I will do my best, and as Ben Stein used to always say yes, he did. as he went into that thing. And you know what? We'll mention when you go on the show and, you know, whoever is the victor will spend the night with your wife or so, something like that. It just will. We'll, we'll <laughs> so come we up with something the at the time. Going to be yeah. and <laughs> we'll come that's up with you admitting some prize. defeat right now, you know. So, so that's over at Guru Showdown, a uh, trivia show. And, uh, you know, what would be really cool what? is if we could beat gurus. Yeah. Because, you know, they had a couple of movie questions in like the animal category. And this, those are the oh, only right. points I got. <laughs> you know, like this 1990 film starring Kevin Costner has an animal in the title. Dances with Wolves. Right. And I was just like, oh, thank goodness, a movie. Um, <laughs> and they talked about that movie with the two tigers in it. What was that called? Brothers, Two Brothers, something like that. Goofy movie. Tigers. Make the scene seen. Make the visible, visible again. Any of this ringing a bell? <laughs> Can you do that as, uh, as Jeff Goldblum? <laughs> make the scene seen. The running and, and screaming. Oh, we need to end this promo and move on. <laughs> oh, this was a promo? I thought we were just talking. Oh, uh, we are just talking about the show that we wanted people to go check out. Oh, I, I don't want them to go check it out. I did that poorly. <laughs> All right. Uh, maybe we should just call that good. Call that this episode and go on to uh, start work for next week's. Yeah, I suppose we could do that. We can move along. I hope you uh, enjoyed the episode, folks. We'll talk to you again next time. I'm Big Anklovich. And I'm Rich Outfield. Good night, folks. Fare thee well. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. If you'd like to submit a story to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine, put your story in the body of an email and send it to submissions at dunesteve.com. I can't read today. I'm tired. Please be sure to check out the submission guidelines at dunesteve.com first. The Dunestorf is released under a Creative Commons unbelievable. Yeah, I'm getting old, you know. Right? The Doonstief is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license, meaning share it with everyone, but don't sell it or change it. Take two. I don't mean to be overly critical, ma'am, I said. But what makes you think the Canicles here? It's a mighty big galaxy, and there can't be 500 people tops in this little town. And as far as I can tell, there ain't no other towns on the planet. You're right, she said. There's just this one town. So what makes you think it's here? Ah. Uh. Whoa. Well, you convince me. It brings back too many painful memories of what might have been between her and me. Might have been a lot of voluptua and a whole bunch of climax. But didn't you bring in the notorious McNulty brothers? No neck and no nose. <laughs> I find it difficult to picture you playing whist. They just don't play no limp whist. Voluptua. <laughs> Sorry. Voluptua von Climax. <laughs> All of a sudden, I'm a Bond girl. You're really Catastrophe Baker? Yeah, I said. The same one who got kicked off Nimbus 4 for... They told me they were in there... Tw <laughs> Let holy, me do it again. Holy cow. Let me do it again. I just took on your accent. <laughs> Our only copy of the canticle was stolen. I need it back, Mr. Baker. Good lord, that's terrible. Well, Catastrophe Baker, it looks like we've got some time to kill. Have you got any ideas on how to make it pass more quickly? And if you say whist, I will shoot you. Where is he likely to be? Probably in one of the bars, she said, carousing with drunken friends and cheap women. He got a name, ma'am? She farted. <laughs> And I thought, wow, Voluptia, that just ain't right. You don't have to tell him, she said, putting her arms around me. I love you, Catastrophe Baker. I know, I said, and I got the love bites to prove it. Love.
love bites. Love bleeds. It's bringing me to my knees. We didn't have any uh, Hoverson helps the hopeless, and I, I don't know. Maybe we shouldn't. Well, but. we can still do it and toss to it separately. Yeah. And include it. Uh, beat that. So, uh, you know, I, I, I look forward to reading it, at least, even if... Why am I, not, why am I talking? We're going to do the second Catastrophe Baker story. If he dies today, we're still going to do it tomorrow. <laughs> I don't get why I'm talking. <laughs> All right, so we're rolling. Oh, Gaby. You are. Well, I guess we could do that if we want to plug the interview. Wasn't it Brian that was saying if the name is too plain that he doesn't care about... Is that like where it was? Will, yeah, he was like Will Johnson or or, or Tom Johnson or Tim. Yeah, you know, there was some name like that that he was just like, I see a name like that, and I throw the book out of the moving <laughs> car. And I'm like, really? The fudge? Do you hear your house breathing? You hear that, right? I don't know what that noise is. I can't say what it is. It's that poltergeist again. <laughs> that sounded like it came from over there. It did. Strangely. That's cool. <laughs> Stay. Bark, bark, wagtail. Good boy. Good boy.